So tonight, we have a fascinating program for you. Boston has always been ambitious and innovative in thinking about transportation, including being the first American city to build a subway and completing the Big Dig, which was the largest inf urban infrastructure project in American history. Today, the Boston metro area boasts one of the highest percentage of commuters that use public transit in the nation. For all of us that live and work in the Boston metro area, the T impacts us in one way or another, for better or worse. And we know, especially after the winter of 2014, that despite the T's storied history and widespread use, public transportation in Boston is facing serious challenges. To explore this situation tonight, we are very fortunate to have with us an impressive group who are intimately familiar with these challenges and have dealt with them firsthand. First, we are joined by Brian Shortsleeve, who is the MBTA's first ever chief administrator. Brian joined the MBTA at the time of creation of the Fiscal and Management Control Board in 2015 with a focus on developing and implementing a strategy to put the TM at a path to fiscal sustainability. Brian has over 20 years of private and public sector experience helping complex organizations through periods of rapid growth and turnaround. Brian is a Massachusetts native, former Marine, and a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Business School. And uh, he's actually had a, a very long relationship with the T, as according to the Boston Globe, he used to take the T from uh, the 74 bus from Belmont to Harvard Square to buy Dungeons and Dragon pieces as a young boy. <laughs> so. Second, uh, we are also very fortunate to have Jim Rooney with us tonight, who is president and CEO of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. Prior to working with the Chamber, Jim was the head of the Massachusetts Convention Center Authority. Jim began his career at the MBTA, where he worked for 18 years, starting as a track laborer and ending as deputy general manager. Jim grew up in South Boston and attended the Boston Latin School. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Harvard College and attended Boston University's School of Management. Finally, we'd like to welcome Chris Osgood, who serves as Mayor Walsh's Chief of the Streets, Transportation, and Sanitation. Prior to serving in this role, Chris co-founded the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics, a nationally replicated civil innovation group that experiments with new ways of using data, design, and technology to improve the constituent experience. Chris joined the city in 2006, serving as a mayoral policy advisor and working on the team that implemented the city's performance management program and rebuilt its 24-hour hotline. Chris is a graduate of City Year, Haverford College, and Harvard Business School. Tonight's program will begin with a short 10-minute film that will give a brief history of public transportation in Boston from the opening of the subway to the last major expansion, which is the extension of the red line and the relocation of the orange line in the 1980s. This will be followed by a presentation by Brian Shortsleeve describing the state of the MBA today and measures that are underway to bring it to financial and operational stability. After Brian's presentation, we will open the program up to a conversation among our panelists and then to questions from our audience. We expect that things should be wrapped up by about 7.15 to 7.30. Thank you all for coming and enjoy the show. The story of the tea begins in 1894 in a Boston that was a very crowded place. Now what public transit was available were very primitive streetcar lines that weren't getting anywhere reliably or fast. So in 1893, uh, Mayor Josiah Quincy asked the legislature for help. And the legislature responded by passing in the following year the Subway Act, which was uh, actually a package of legislation that planned much of the subway system as we know it. Now, the Boston Elevated Railway was unique. It was a monopoly. In fact, it was one of the largest urban transit monopolies of the day. It was a private monopoly, too, that was chartered by the state for one purpose, to offer the people of Boston a, transit, a subway system that was expansive, but inexpensive. And to that end, the Subway Acts uh, built a web of regulations, two of the most important ones being that the elevated railway company had to offer all of its services for a fixed five cent fare and free transfers. Boston's first subway opened in 1897, and elevated railway construction began in 1900. And over the next 15 years, the system was expanded into, into new neighborhoods and new suburbs almost constantly. The Boston Elevated Railway Company, of course, couldn't raise fares and had no access to state subsidies. So the cost of running more service, of building more infrastructure, of hiring more people, cut away very quickly at its profits. Now, in 1900, the company was modestly profitable. 
By about 1910, it was barely breaking even. In 1912, it posted its first subway deficit. And by 1917, it was on the verge of financial collapse. And in 1917, 1918, the regulations were rewritten. Much of the Subway Act was swept away and was replaced by a new regulatory regime that would allow the, the managers of the company to raise fares, that would grant them access to some very basic state subsidies, but would bring the system under the control of a publicly appointed board of directors, so board of directors that were appointed by the governor. After 1920, after fare increases, its, sta its finances stabilized. So regulators and public officials assumed that the new regime would work. That, and it did work until the Great Depression. And the Great Depression uh, plunged the company back into economic turmoil that would persist through World War II. And finally, in 1946, the state decided they were just going to bring the entire system under, pub under full public ownership, and they dissolved the Boston Elevated Railway Company. And in its place, in 1946, the state, chartered, the state formed a new public transportation monopoly, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, or MTA. And the MTA inherited a lot of the baggage from its predecessor. Its equipment was old. It inherited all the debt that the Boston Elevated Railway Company had shouldered. A lot of its, its infrastructure was falling apart. It, it was born, nevertheless, amid an atmosphere of optimism because public officials assumed that a public entity would be able to raise money more, at a lower cost than the private entity could. It would allow the MTA to inherit the Boston Elevated Railway's mandate of providing a system that was expansive but inexpensive. But unfortunately, the regulators were, soon, were quickly disappointed. The so suburbanization in the 1950s caused the MTA's ridership and finances to fall, even though its costs rose. And on top of that, you had legislators who wanted to expand the system, but at no extra cost. They wanted uh, bigger lines, they wanted longer transit lines, but less transit debt. So the confluence of these influences uh, caused the uh, Metropolitan Transit Authority's finances to collapse. And by 1960, they, they, were on the, they were in a state of financial collapse. And in 1964, the um, the governor dissolved the MTA. Well, the history of how the Orange Line and the Red Line got built goes back um, in the modern era, that is in the 1980s, really goes back to um, the election of 1968, when um, Nixon was elected president and John Volpe was governor of Massachusetts and he resigned the governorship to join the Nixon cabinet as secretary of transportation. And his lieutenant governor, Frank Sargent, then became the acting governor. He was sworn in uh, as acting governor and took the traditional walk down the State House steps and was greeted with a very significant and loud and pop well populated demonstration. And it was a demonstration uh, against highway expansion and also against Logan Airport expansion. By May, he delivered a speech to Urban America, which was meeting in Boston. Um, and committed to appointing a Blue Ribbon Task Force to look at the highway and transit controversies. And by August, Alan Altshuler, who was then a professor of political science at MIT, was uh, named by the governor as the chair of this task force. And um, when he was asked to be the chair of the task force, he asked me to be executive director. And uh, by December of 69, the task force reported to the governor that he should put a halt on uh, further planning for expressways and transit lines. And in, instead of proceeding with those plans, have a two to three year restudy of the need for the facilities, how transit and highway could be integrated, and how whatever is built fits in with the urban environment and the natural environment. So for him to put a moratorium on the planning meant that he was going to put at risk a billion dollars 
in federal aid to highways. So the governor decided he was going to have a restudy. And he went on statewide TV because a billion dollars in highway aid was at stake. And he announced that he was putting a moratorium on the planning. These were banner headlines at the time. There was 14% unemployment in the construction industry. And um, it was very courageous of him to do that. And what he said was that uh, he was going to take about half the money that would have gone into the design study of an inner belt, Cambridge and Somerville, and use it for a two to three year restudy of the need for these facilities. The governor said he was going to have make sure that this study was an open study, looking at a wide range of options with costs and benefits of each major option looked at in an objective way. So the technical staff, and I was the state's director, was charged with being neutral and developing a series of options. I will say that when the task force made its recommendation to the governor in December of 1969, this is really, I think, very significant. That is the same week that the United States Congress enacted what came to be known as NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. And NEPA required that for any f major federal action, there had to be a look at a wide range of alternatives, measuring the costs and benefits, and do it in a transparent way. So here was a state that wanted to do what the federal law suddenly required. And therefore, the BTPR, as it came to be known, Boston Transportation Planning Review, was like a fishbowl. People came from all, all over the country to watch how we were doing the neighborhood workshops and the technical assistance and developing new options and, and all of that. So, the governor's decision was really part of a nationwide trend of taking the environment, both the built environment and the natural environment, more seriously. So the results came in um, as a result of the process. He had an interim set of decisions that he made. It was to kill the inner belt. Uh, would take, it was too deleterious to the inner urban environment and to kill a Route 2 extension from Alewife into the inner belt. And he said that in the interest of preserving Boston's dense downtown with its already existing and historic transit access, that's what needs to be built on and, and retained and expanded. So it was a transit access to dense downtown. So part of the governor's address uh, when he went on statewide TV was, he said, I am putting at risk a billion dollars in federal aid to highways by this decision. But I'm not just going to sit back and do nothing about that. I'm going to go to Washington and change federal law so that we can use that billion dollars for transit instead of these big expressways. And Alan Altshuler led the charge. It was originally called the Boston Provision. It was uh, to be an amendment to the Federal Aid to Highway Act. Um, and suddenly it became clear that metropolitan areas all over the country wanted this. So it was actually enacted in 1974, which is pretty fast for the federal government. And it, it was known as, is known as the interstate transfer provision. It allowed municipalities that go through a certain kind of process, planning process, looking at alternatives, to um, exchange their interstate highway money for transit money and use that money to build the transit. And that is the billion dollars that went into extending the red line from Harvard Square, Porter, Davis, Alewife, and relocation of the orange line from Washington Street on the elevated to the Amtrak corridor.
All right. Well, great. Thank you for the uh, thank you for the video. Let me come back here. Uh, I'm going to walk around a little bit, and I'm going to encourage everyone to ask questions as we go. We'll spend about 20 minutes walking through these materials, uh, starting with the findings of the governor's uh, special panel on the MBTA after the uh, meltdown in the uh, winter of 2015. I'm going to encourage Jim Rooney and Chris Osgood to jump in. Um, the MBTA is really a Boston story through and through, so we work very close with Chris and his team in the mayor's office and everything we do. And Jim knows more about the MBTA than I will ever forget about the MBTA, so uh, I would encourage him to jump in as well. Um, but in, in the winter of 2015, the, the T failed in, uh, in fairly spectacular fashion, as, uh, as all of you, I'm sure, recall. And the governor's uh, special panel um, came out with uh, nine findings on the T. Um, about a third of them are related to capital investment and the inability to get capital projects done quickly. We'll talk about that in the latter part of the presentation. We have a very large deferred maintenance backlog, and we've actually got a lot of funding available as an organization to work that backlog down, but the T has struggled over time to get projects done and get them out the door. Um, we also had a, a rapidly expanding operating budget deficit, um, which is driven by a historic rate of of OPEX growth at kind of in the you know four to five percent range and revenues growing at about a third that in a widening deficit every year and then um, finally a lack of customer focus and a lot of ineffective workplace practices including um, sky high overtime and absenteeism which contributed in large part to our operating deficit. I think it's always uh, useful with the T to start historically on what the the trend has been in terms of our total spending to run the system and if you look at the top blue line um, that's the annual operating expenses to run the T, not including debt. So this is just pure OPEX, wages, benefits, fuel, et cetera. And the bottom light blue line is the number of annual trips delivered. So if you look at fiscal 16, we delivered about 391 million trips. It cost about $1.6 billion to do that. The implication over 15 years of flat ridership uh, and expenses uh, growing by about two and a half is that the cost to deliver a single trip has more than doubled. Um, which indicates from an organizational standpoint the the T has not been able through productivity, efficiency, other ways to st keep that constant or move it down. It's been a steady upward, upward climb in an environment where ridership is up slightly, but, but not much. Um, this is the picture. I, I joined the organization in the summer of 2015 when the Fiscal and Management Control Board came into being. I'd worked with Governor Baker at General Catalyst Partners. Uh, when he lost the 2010 race, he came to General Catalyst. And I had a background in turnarounds and things. We worked together closely. And I told him that someday I hoped he would be governor. If he ever got himself in a jam and needed help on something, I'd, I'd love to take some time in public service. So be careful what you wish for. Uh, because when, he, uh, when the Fiscal Management Control Board came in, he asked me to step in and really um, devise with that board and the team a, a financial strategy, get the, P, the, get the T on track financially. And this was the projected budget deficit when we arrived in the summer of 15. To orient you here, the red line at the top is the total expenses of the T, which if you look at uh, fiscal 16 on the far left will be just over $2 billion. Uh, and the revenues of the T were $1.85. Um, over the five-year projected period, uh, operating expenses were projected to grow at about 4.5% and revenues at one5 So as that dynamic continues with expenses outgrowing revenues, the deficit gets larger and larger each year. Um, the deficit for fiscal 16, which is the year we finished, just two months ago was projected to be about $170 million. Uh, and by fiscal 20, that number was projected to be over $400 million. And I think it's, it's largely this picture that caused the legislature, I think, to support the governor in a lot of his reform efforts because uh, the T does get statutory revenues, a piece of the sales tax, local assessments from Boston and Cambridge and fares. But the legislature has traditionally funded the gap each year through something called additional state assistance. And in the summer of 15, the projected additional funding to the T was going to be over $400 million. I think that's one of the reasons why the legislature um, you know, went along with, with the reform package. In terms of the revenue sources of the T, I think it's always um, useful to look at this because the T's revenues are unlikely to grow at over 2%. Historically, they've grown at about 1.5, 1.6. Uh, we get a penny of the sales tax, um, which has been growing at about half a percent a year. That's our largest source of revenue. Uh, we get local assessments from Boston and Cambridge, which we are thankful for. Uh, Boston's a big piece of that, and that's been growing at a, under a point. Um, our fares, uh, we raised this year by about 9%. There's a new legislative cap in place at 3.5% per year, so I think 3.5% is probably a reasonable out-year projection. Then finally, the T has revenues from advertising, parking, and real estate, which are small. 
Um, we've been growing them very aggressively, but they're small. In the aggregate, the organization, 1.9 billion of revenue, will grow that revenue at somewhere between 1.8 and 2%. So the mandate we set for the team starting last summer was to um, build cost models and start to actively manage costs to get our cost growth below, below that uh, level. Uh, over the past 12 months, we've focused on a variety of things at the T. Number one, setting financial targets for every department, holding managers accountable. That's not something that uh, had existed um, before 2015. It may have existed historically in Jim's day, but when we got there, in terms of department level budgeting, there wasn't much in place. Um, we put overtime and attendance policies in place, which also didn't exist. The T had run over a $56 million overtime bill in 2015. Some of that's winter time, but a lot of it was lack of policy, a lack of focus. Um, we've refinanced all the debt, which uh, saved about $160 million over the next decade. The T's got $5 billion of debt, so this was a good time to go out and refinance. Um, we're in process on going to all the, the businesses that we partner with, service providers, and trying to negotiate discounts and things. And we're having pretty good luck there. I'll, I'll walk through that. Um, we've also really focused on driving our advertising, parking, and our real estate revenue. Those are things that we control as an organization. The T has great real estate assets. We've got all these stations. And driving advertising revenue um, is an important part of the strategy, which, is, which has begun. We're in the early stages, but it's, um, I think it's starting to show some, um, some, some fruition. The ride, which is our paratransit offering, is, a, is another very large budget item for us. The T spends over $100 million a year um, moving folks around who are uh, eligible for paratransit services. And we recently there launched a partnership with Uber and Lyft, which is really exciting so that ride members can take Uber and Lyft in lieu of the ride if they'd like to. Uh, the ride costs us close to $92 per round trip. Uh, Uber and Lyft is uh, under 30 most of those trips are actually inside the city of Boston for $92. So I think the rides in the area, you'll see us saving money this year and probably saving big money um, in the out years. On, on the overtime front, we put a whole bunch of new policies in place. Um, we developed new patrol plans with the police force. We're looking at overtime every week, every month. Uh, every manager is accountable for uh, the decision to hire overtime. Uh, and, is, and is being managed pretty closely around a goal of keeping our overtime bill under $100,000 a day. Uh, we've also put caps in on daily and weekly overtime. Uh, and this will just give you a sense of kind of where we are this year. So in 2015, we were running about $150,000 a day in overtime. We're now running at about 111 this year. We're still not at 100. At 100, we'd be at about $36 million. We're making progress. We're also down below where we were in 14 and 13, which is really important um, because there's an element of the 2015 story, which is weather. But there's also just another big element of a total, frankly, a lack of management and a lack of policy. So our goal is to, is to keep working that number down, I think, and I think we will. Um, we've also focused on absenteeism. That's been a big challenge at the T. In fiscal 15, uh, the absenteeism rate for our bus drivers was close to 13%. Um, what that means, in a 20-day month, so our drivers are scheduled for 20 work days. In a 20 day month, that means missing about two and a half days. Uh, and that, as, as Jim would know from his days, it's challenging to run the organization with, with that level of absenteeism because from an operational standpoint, it really impedes you and it drives up our overtime costs. So we put a whole slew of new policies and procedures in place starting in January of this year um, around a new attendance policy, stricter requirements. Um, the T had a very, very high level of uh, usage of the Family Medical Leave Act. If you look at MassDOT, about 7% of employees were registered for FMLA. Um, across state governments, around 10. Uh, at the T, it was 30. And in the Carmen's Union, it was at 50%. Um, that's a big challenge when you're trying to run a railroad. Because what it means for folks that are registered in FMLA is that if they are out for an unexcused absence, um, that's a protected absence. And it's very difficult to put people on disciplinary track. So one of the goals of this policy was to drop that significantly. Uh, and we're now running with the Carmen's Union down below 30. So it's dropped from 50 to about 28% um, certification. Still a lot higher than state government, but having a very, very significant and positive uh, impact. It's also been highly controversial. So the union has filed a grievance on the attendance policy, and that is kind of working its way through the legislative process. It's not a popular policy, but it's, um, it's certainly having an impact. This is a snapshot on our absenteeism. We were up at 13% in fiscal 15. We're now down at 10. And as I said, our, our FMLA certification numbers are under 30 now for the Carmen's Union, and under 25 for the rest of the organization. So we're, we're making progress. Um, but it still means that you know, at 
with 1,800 bus drivers, that still means on any given day you've got almost 200 drivers that don't show up to work, um, which from a scheduling and an operational standpoint so is a big challenge that we've got to continue to work on. Uh, another benefit of the lower absenteeism has been that our drop trips have come way down. So this is just a snapshot in our bus system on the number of trips that we drop every day. So if you're a bus, dro a bus uh, customer, a drop trip means that you were there waiting for the trip, driver didn't show up, the trip didn't run. Um, this year, we're about 30% below where we've been. So on any given day, we're dropping about 100 trips, still too high, but well below you know, where we've been in fiscal 15. This is a direct result of better attendance. And as we continue to improve attendance, these numbers will continue to uh, come down. We've also, uh, as we look at cost, we were auditing and reviewing every business relationship that the T has. We literally have hundreds and hundreds of contracts with outside vendors. And in many, way, in many areas, the T's never gone through line by line and, and tried to get discounts and things from vendors, which from a business standpoint, I grew up in the business world, one of the first things we'd always do when we bought a company is go look at the wireless plan and see if we could save some money on wireless, see if we could pull minutes, et cetera. Basic, a basic review. Um, and this is just an example of something we did with Verizon where we uh, did an audit of the Verizon wireless accounts. And we had almost a third of the phones at the T hadn't been used in more than a year. Hadn't made a phone call, hadn't sent a piece of data. So we canceled 600 phones, we pulled minutes, you know, we're saving a million dollars a year. It's not going to close a $100 million deficit, but the little things matter. Um, we're also putting the T onto all the statewide contracts. The state of Massachusetts has very favorable pricing in a lot of things, and for a bunch of historical reasons, the T had not used those statewide contracts. Uh, and we're slowly moving on. As in one example here, um, this is uh, from Granger. We buy a lot of equipment for our bus garages. The statewide contract price for a screwdriver's five bucks, and we were paying 13. Now, we didn't buy a ton of them. We only bought a couple hundred. But we think with a couple hundred million dollars of spend that getting onto the statewide contract will probably save us five to eight million dollars a year. Um, and I think it's a good, for the, for the organization, I think it's a good move business-wise. Um, we also ran the first competitive bond sale that the T had done in more than 20 years. A competitive sale means rather than um, kind of engaging a banker directly to do a negotiated transaction, you line all the banks up and you do effectively an online bid to get the best price you can at that day in the marketplace. And the T had, had not done this in, in, in almost two decades. So we ran the sale back in, um, this was back in July, and we got 18 banks to, to bid. This, what you see here is kind of the 10 final bidders. Uh, and we refinanced out about $500 million of our debt and <coughs> dropped our interest rates in half. In this case, Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan um, were the winners of, of the auction. But this was a good, open, transparent process, which from a dollars and cents standpoint will, will save us $160 million. And also, I think, brought a bunch of banks to the table that traditionally didn't do business with the T because they didn't have a relationship you know, or whatever. Um, but it's an important part of our, of our operating expenses because we've got, you know, we spend close to $500 million a year on debt service. Um, so this slide will just give you a sense of kind of where we stand after a year. Um, the blue bars represent the annual rate of operating expense growth of the T. So for example, in fiscal 09, OPEX grew at 9.7% over the previous year. So over the 15 year average, OPEX grew at about 5%. We set a goal to grow it at under two. Uh, we came in this first year, which is fiscal 16 at, at minus 0 0.3. There's a, there's a benefit in there of energy of about half a point. So if you, if you added back the benefit of energy, we finished the year at about a half a point. And we're going to try to have another year in fiscal 17 where we hold the, hold the line pretty close to zero. And if we can do that for a few years and put zeros up with cost growth and the revenues moving with the fares and everything else, I think we have a real shot at, at starting to close um, what was a pretty large deficit. This is a recap on, on where we stand so far on the deficit. So the top red line you see was the projected operating deficit for the T. It was $119 million in fiscal 15. It was forecast at 170 for fiscal 16, which is the year that we finished a couple months ago. We came in um, at about half of that. And for fiscal 17, we're shooting to be at 80, but we're trying to work it down towards zero uh, you know, against a, a projection of 240. Most of that's cost control. I mean, so we did raise fares, which helps. Uh, we are pushing revenue. But, but, but given that our, our cost base is $2 billion, most of the benefit here has been to grow our cost more slowly, or at zero, and in some places actually reduce our costs. You can see of the $84 million improvement so far, about $75 million of this cost control and $10 million is revenue. Um, there's a real big opportunity for the T in terms of advertising. 
Um, so you can see these digital panels here. This is an example of a panel. We get close to uh, $6,000 a month for these panels, 50, 60 grand a year. Uh, we just bid out the contract for these. We're going to bring in a new company called CBS Outdoor. Um, and we're going to have a, a new deal with them. This is one of the contracts we rebid where the T will take 70% of the gross revenue from what hopefully over time will be three or 400 uh, billboards in stations. About a third of the time on those, on those billboards, you'll see public service announcements, the schedule, et cetera, and the rest of it will be advertising. Uh, and our goal here with advertising is to build a 50-ish million dollar a year advertising business, which if we add that to parking and real estate, we think we could be about $100 million a year in non-fair operating revenue. Which long term for the organization will be a really important, um, a really important uh, pillar. And this, I think, is another example of the benefit of competitively bidding contracts. The T had a lot of existing vendors that have been in business with us for a long time that had not been rebid. And what we find when we go out to market and we, we rebid things like this contract, we very significantly improved our economics for the, uh, for the organization. Um, as we focus on cost control, we are mindful that what our customers care about is performance, right? For our customers, what they care about is, did the train come in the way? I ride the commuter rail almost every morning. I know a lot of folks in this room ride the red line and the orange line. Um, so the target we have for the subway and the commuter rail is 90% on time performance. This is a quick snapshot. Um, we're now publishing every day our performance statistics. You can look at daily, weekly, trailing 30 days. This I pulled out uh, about two weeks ago. And this will give you a sense on the left for commuter rail, where we stand. This is peak on time performance, just below 90. And for, and for the subway, we're, you know, we're, in the, we're in the 80s. Transparency is a critical part of our approach to the organization. So in the same way we're publishing our financial metrics and our overtime metrics and our absenteeism, we're putting this out every day um, for folks who are following the T to know how we're, how we're doing. Uh, this, is, this breaks it out by line, and you can see that the heavy rail, which is the red line, the orange line, and the blue line, are pretty consistently running over 90%. Commuter rail has been bouncing around a little bit, but it's, it's close to 90. The green line is a challenge. I mean, the green line's not on here because it's actually a different system, a light trolley system. Uh, but the green line and the bus, if they were on here, would be in the 70s or so. So green line and bus is a big challenge for us operationally. With the bus, a lot of it's frankly traffic. And with the green line, it's a combination of traffic and systems. Uh, and those two are really working on. But I think uh, Jeff Goneville, who's the COO, has spent a lot of time over the past year, particularly on the orange and red line. I think we're seeing, you know, we're seeing solid, solid progress there. Uh, we're also really pushing the organization to engage with innovative, cutting-edge technology companies, which historically um, wasn't something that the T did enough of, but there's terrific opportunity, particularly here in Boston. Um, so this will give you a sense for our new relationship with Uber for paratransit. And you can see in the middle, that's the Uber app. Uh, and if you're a ride customer for the T and you want to use it, you get into the trial, um, you can use the existing ride uh, service, which is you call in 24 hours, you schedule the vehicle that comes and picks you up, or you can use your Uber app. There's the T logo, you hit the button, uh, and they've got both accessible vehicles, which is this snapshot, or you can use UberX. Our deal for folks in the ride is that the T will pay the first $2, or excuse me, the customer pays the first $2 versus $3 on the ride, so the customer gets a dollar break. We'll pay the next 13, and then anything over and above that's back, back to the customer. So th this is designed really for our ride customers that are moving in distances that are under 15 bucks, a lot of city of Boston stuff, which is close to 40% of our rides. Right now we're spending almost $92 a trip to move people around Boston, for example, from Kenmore to Back Bay. With this uh, program, we're, we're cutting that by close to 70%, and customers love it. This is something the accessibility community, our ride customers have been, have been asking for for a long time. We're also in business with Lyft, uh, and Lyft, Uber is purely app. Lyft has set up a call center, so for folks that want to use this but aren't smartphone users, they can call the call center and they can get a Lyft vehicle to come um, pick them up. Another area of focus for us in the next five years is the red line. We've got brand new cars coming in for both the red and the orange line. So for anyone in this room that rides the red and the orange line, I can tell you it's going to get a lot better. Not next year, but within five years we're going to have over 300 brand new vehicles. Um, this is an example of the red line of the braking distance on the new vehicles, which will be significantly shorter than the old vehicles. And what that means is we'll be able to run them closer together. Um, so through a combination of upgrading the fleet and then upgrading the signals system, um, we believe that we can increase capacity on the red line by close to 50%, which I think will be a game changer, particularly for a lot of the folks that come up from the South Shore. If you've ever been down there in Quincy Adams or Braintree in the morning, those trains um, fill up pretty quickly. We're also 
working on a version of this for the orange lab. I think the red line's a little bit, a little bit, um, a little bit farther along. Another big area of focus for us at the T this year, as we look into next year, is trying to um, get the organization off of paper and, and kind of into a modern era, you know, vis-a-vis -vis using software and things. The T still does uh, all of its timekeeping on paper. You can see over here, this is the, the little uh, score sheets that they're used in each bus garage. We store all of it uh, in neat piles, which you can see on the left. Uh, and, we, and we do the same thing with scheduling a lot of our bus routes. It's done by hand in the bus garages. When you walk in, there's these huge things that look like bingo boards where drivers pick their routes by hand, a process that hasn't changed in, in 30 years. So we're in process on upgrading a lot of this, which I think is really going to help us drive efficiency and certainly, and certainly save money. Um, we also, uh, in the summer of 15, received a three-year waiver from the Pacheco Law. Uh, and the Pacheco Law is a law that was put in place in the early 90s that sets uh, a set of very high barriers for public agencies to, to contract out services. So the T was given a three-year waiver, uh, which the governor always reminds me we've already used one year of, so now it's a two-year waiver because uh, time's flying. Uh, and we're going through every part of the organization to look at places we believe that we could partner with the private sector uh, and we could find partners that could do things for us much more efficiently than we can do them ourselves. Two of the early areas of focus were the money room and our warehouse. Uh, the money room, we had an outside group come in and look at over the summer. You may have read about it if you've been following it in the newspaper. Uh, but their, their, their analysis was, was that we were overstaffed um, in the aggregate close to two and a half to one. Uh, with our drivers, we had a productivity of about 25% of the industry average. So, you know, a Brinks driver is doing 40 pickups uh, a route. You know, our drivers were, were doing nine. Um, and there's a lot of history on this. As Judge King, who's here, was reminding me, the money room has been kind of a storied part of the T for a long time. Uh, but we put, we, put, we put RFP out. We got a great response from industry. Um, here's where the bids came in. So you can see on the left was the fully loaded cost for our internal money room operations, which is $11.8 million a year. That includes um, retiree health and pension. That's fully loaded. Um, Brinks came in at 3.6. Garter World came in at 4.7. So we uh, elected to move forward with Brinks last week. That also got, you know, got a bunch of press. It was um, controversial. The benefit of a company like Brinks, they're going to run their own trucks. They've got their own counting room. They're going to have their own software. So they're not going to come into our facility and run it, they're going to plug us into their existing facility. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're getting the pricing we are, because they've got the trucks, they've got the, the, the smarts, they've got the warehouses. Uh, and the facility we have, we can use for something else or we can monetize. It's worth three to four million dollars. But this was the first, first one of well, what I hope will be many of examples where we'll partner with the private sector to get much better service at what I think will probably be anywhere from a 30 to a 70 percent um, discount to our internal cost. The warehouse is, uh, is the next area of focus. You'll be reading about this uh, in the coming months. Our existing warehouse operations have inventory accuracy on average of about 50%, which means when you go to look for a part, the right part's in the right place only about half the time. Um, the industry average is about 95. The RFP we put out asked private sector companies to commit to 97% plus. And the kind of companies that are bidding on this or the Napa auto parts of the world, businesses like that that do this for a living. They've got systems, they've got software, they've got people, they've got vehicles, they've got warehouses. So again, I think in this case, as we get bids in, we'd be looking to partner with someone who will bring their own business system to us. In our existing facilities, we would, um, our existing warehouse, we would, we would repurpose for something else. Um, I think having a, a, a private sector partner in the warehouse will also really help us in our maintenance operations, because right now it takes us 82 hours to deliver a part from the central warehouse to our facility. So if you look at Amazon.com, they can get me a book from San Francisco to Boston in 24 hours, but it's taken us almost four days to move a part from Everett um, to Lynn. So the industry standard here is 12. I think we're going to get companies that will probably commit to eight hours with, you know, with emergency service if we need it. This will be a big deal for our maintenance operations, because when, when you've got to wait 82 hours to get a part, it drives our expenses and it drives our productivity. And again, I think we've got some great companies that'll probably help us out on that. Uh, another area of focus for us are the overall costs of our bus operation. So we, we spent this past year about $325 million at the T to run just under 2 million revenue miles. That's about $170 per hour in total. This is fully loaded cost. Um, we have contracts right now with private uh, companies like, for example, Paul Revere, 
they run routes for us at around $125 to $130 an hour. And, th and that's actually not even a union, non-union story because Paul Revere is all Teamsters Local 25 drivers. So they're union drivers, but they're private sector union drivers. And as a, as a business, they've been able to find efficiencies that, that we so far haven't. Um, so as we look at our system here, uh, we think there's probably a 30 to 40 percent advantage in starting to expand contracting with private bus companies. And that's something we're going to be looking at very closely. Late night service, which we've been talking about with the city, may be one of the first opportunities to do that. If we look at running buses all night long, um, running them at you know 100 bucks an hour versus 170 dollars an hour for our organization will you know will make a big difference. Um, let's finish on capital because I think at the end of the day, capital spending is what our Riders are going to notice the most. Um, the T is an antiquated system. It's an old system. It's a system that's deeply in need of repair. Um, this is an example of a switch that is live on the system right now. It was, we debate whether it was manufactured in 1915 or patented in 1915, but it's marked 1915. Um, and we've literally got power cables that are 30 years old. We've got electrical systems that are failing. So dramatically increasing the rate of capital spending is a, is a, is a really core um, priority for the Baker administration. What we've uh, just published in the last couple months is a five-year capital plan that will double spending on track uh, signals and power. Not, this is not sexy, exciting stuff that doesn't make for great ribbon cuttings, but it's really important. You know, if you ride the core system, if you ride the red line, if you ride the orange line, this is the kind of investment you, you really notice. About 30% of the reason why subway trains are late is signals related. So. If we do the hard work to put a new signal system in, that's what people are really going to notice. Um, so we're doubling spending in power and signals. And then in revenue vehicles, we're also um, almost doubling spending based on where we were for the last five years. So we've got a brand new red line fleet coming in, a brand new orange line fleet coming in. The green line, we're, we're trying to figure out. The green line's very tricky because the downtown tunnels are really tight. So those have always been almost custom-made cars. Um, so we're working on that, but we've also got almost half the bus fleet being replaced next year. So I think from a rider standpoint, over the next five years, you really start to, to see some of this pay fruition. We're also very actively um, putting the savings we're generating from our operating budget cost control into this capital maintenance lockbox fund. So if you go back to our operating budget, the state gives us $187 million a year right now in excess of our statutory revenues to close that budget deficit because we came in this year with an $80 million deficit instead of a forecast at 170. We got about $100 million extra, if you will, from the state. So we are putting all those savings into something called the Capital Maintenance Lockbox Fund, which right now is about $120 million. And this is going to be all focused on investing in, in core system growth. Um, this is a quick snapshot on historically where the T has been in terms of capital spending. Uh, as an organization, we've really struggled to get our capital plan out the door every year. You can see on average, we, we hit about 70% of what's available. In fiscal 16, for example, we had a billion one available to us. We only could spend 740, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, the T has a big operating side, but it's also a massive construction company internally. So this is projects, bridge projects, signal projects, and when they run over, typically they're running over because the project got delayed, the permits weren't in place. It's all the reasons you'd think of with construction, but it's an area we really have to improve because what we're hoping to do as we get out to fiscal 17, 18, 19 is consistently be putting over a billion dollars a year into the system, and the money's there. It's just been, frankly, an execution, uh, an execution challenge. We're publishing every month now kind of where we're trending. So you can see here the blue line on the bottom is our monthly spending. Um, when I got to the T, they closed the capital books once a year. So once a year, they would put a marker in terms of where they were. And from an organizational standpoint, um, what I think what that creates is, is, it, it is not enough of a sense of urgency of getting projects done. So we're now every month publishing these numbers and really pushing on the project managers to figure out if things are slipping, why they're slipping. If we know things are slipping, let's bring other projects in because the goal is to be putting over a billion dollars a year into the ground. And finally, this is just the um, snapshot on, on this year's spending. It's fairly back-weighted. A lot of that in the backside is revenue vehicles that we'll be buying in Q4. Um, and then I'll just finish with a, with a couple quick ones. Um, we're modernizing the automated fare collection system. So for those of you that ride the system, within two years, you'll be able to use debit, credit cards, swipe in, swipe out. Um, we're going to try to get away from cash entirely. Um, we're going to, this will enable zone-based pricing, by the way. So right now you pay the same fare 
depending on what time, regardless of what time of day it is or where you're going. With a system like this, which London just put in, um, we're going to be able to have much more flexibility on pricing. And from a customer standpoint, you'll be able to use your, your phone, you'll be able to use a, a debit card, a credit card. It'll be, I think it'll be a real, a, real, um, a real game changer. Let me just finish, uh, and then we'll open it up to the group uh, in terms of other things kind of on our mind looking out. The T-Pension uh, is often a question at, at these events. It's been a challenge uh, for a while. Uh, right now, that the T-Pension is paying out about $100 and $90 million a year, and, and what's coming in is about $100 million a year. So there's a, net, there's a net outflow each year of $90 million, which you know, needs to be made up by investment returns. So we're looking at this very closely. Again, this is one you know, you've probably seen in the newspapers. Every year in which the, the pension fund returns under about 6%, the asset base falls. So last year, the asset base fell by about $90 million because the returns were zero. Um, so the sustainability of the pensions is a big area of focus. This is a contract be between us and the Carmen's Union, so that's going to be an active part of our discussions, I think, with them as we, as we go forward. Uh, and it's something we're going to be really focused on long term to make sure the organization can, can support the pensions, support our, uh, our retirees. Okay, Chris. Just by show of hands, how many folks took the team uh, today at some part of their Just by show of hands, how many folks took the team today at some part of their Everything. So, roughly a third of the people who live and work in the city of Boston, who work up 40% of the people who work in Boston, who work in the region, uh, took the team uh, here. I just want to underscore very briefly, at least from the city's perspective, the incredible importance of the work that Brian, uh, the secretary, sorry about that, uh, the governor and the entire team is working on. We are at an amazing moment in Boston's history. Uh, we're in the third big, biggest growth period. Uh, for Boston. About two and a half years ago, the mayor put forward a pledge to build 53,000 new units of housing by 2030. <laughs> so two and a half years ago, 53,000 units. Today, two and a half years later, we're about 35,000 units of housing already in the development pipeline. We're absolutely sort of the skyrocketing growth, and the person to my left deserves a lot of credit for, uh, for that. Thank you. Uh, the second sort of big challenge that we're facing is one around equity, and perhaps more than anything else, that is a, a top priority for our mayor. Uh, so at the beginning of this year, the Brookings Institute um, put us at the top of a list, which, uh, frankly, we, we, don't, we don't necessarily want to be at the top of. It's the number one city for income inequality in the United States. Um, our 95th percentile earners make about 18 times as much as our 20th percentile earners. Um, there's a huge amount of work that we are doing in the city to make sure that there's a great opportunity for economic mobility, and a lot of that has to do with sort of physical mobility and transportation mobility we provide as a city. And the third big challenge that we're facing as a city is one around uh, climate change, um, not just the climate shocks that we faced uh, two winters ago that were referenced by both Tony and Brian, uh, and the 108 inches of snow that fell on our city over that winter that I feel like we are still cleaning up from, um, but really the um, actually being able to prepare for things like sea level rise uh, and the flooding of some of our internal waterways as we sit in a building which I believe at one point the Muddy River once would have uh, been a part of. So I think that um, it's really important to us in the city of Boston to be an international leader as we think about how to cut emissions. And it is incredibly clear to us that we cannot unlock growth and we cannot solve um, uh, the challenge of income inequality and we cannot be an international leader in cutting emissions uh, if we do not have uh, an incredibly well-functioning MBTA. Um, so uh, just I want to sort of underscore uh, all of the good work that is happening um, at the T because um, their partnership uh, with us is, is vital for the transportation objectives that our constituents have for the city. Um, and delighted to sort of dive into more of the specifics of both what Brian pointed out, um, but just more broadly wanted to underscore um, where I feel like we are and the importance of the T going forward for the city. Um, great. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think I'd begin by um, uh, discussing a little bit about more of my background at the T. It actually, I was amused by some of your early days at the T, and as the introduction was going on, I was listen, uh, thinking back to taking a bus, a train, and a trolley when I was about 12 years old to get myself from something over the Latin school every day, and um, the memories I, I had of that. And then as I was watching the video uh, about the orange and the red line, um, again, uh, brought back memories because I worked on both of those projects, the red line extension from Harvard to Whale Life and um, the orange line uh, Southwest Carter project. Uh, I actually had the um, opportunity to manage the cutover, uh, which was, uh, if people can remember that famous picture, and I think it was Utah where the 
east and the west kind of railroads met and it was that final spike driven. Uh, it was one of those moments in T history where the new southwest corridor met the tunnel around New England Medical Center. Um, we had a four day shutdown that we cut over from the old elevated to the to the new southwest corridor. So I had four days to get that project done um, to make a Monday morning rush hour. Uh, and uh, and we made it. So a lot of um, a lot of memories. Um, but with that background when when you hear um, uh, Ryan paint a picture of what he found um, at the T. Uh, I can tell you, for someone who was there from, I guess, 1976 to 1993, um, uh, it's really saddening and disheartening um, to hear what occurred over um, several decades. Um, I applaud what um, what Brian and his team is doing to to sort of fix things and to stop the bleeding and and try to correct things that clearly are, uh, are wrong about the operations. And I think those of you that ride the tea and experience any level of frustration, some of the data and statistics that were pointed out probably um, underscore for you why those kinds of things happen. Um, but I think um, if you had to summarize sort of what led us here, uh, and we actually at the chamber hosted a panel of of people who run the, the um, transit authorities in New York, Washington, and Philadelphia, three East Coast big old transit systems, and asked them, how does a last year, uh, earlier this year, I guess, um, asked them, how does a transit system get to the point that it displays some of the systems that, that Brian, uh, symptoms that Brian talked about? Uh, and it won't be surprising that much of what they said was on Brian's first slide, and it gets summed up in really two big categories. One is management, and the second is a, is a period of lack of investment. Uh, and if you look at what um, the team at the T is having to deal with, uh, Brian highlighted the 1915 signal equipment, but uh, if you look at things, and now I'm old enough to say it, if you look at some of the things I was involved in building and in constructing, um, that cut over the orange line was in 1987. So, you know, it's, uh, some of the equipment is reached its use of life. Um, some of the bus garages that people are maintaining things in are built in the 50s and the 60s. There's vehicles out in the road that were built in the 70s, I think, are the oldest ones. Uh, anyone driving a car that was built in the 1970s? Um, you're, you're riding a bus sometimes that was. Uh, built. I guess we have a couple of people um, <laughs> that, are, that are doing that. So, um, so the, the the challenge, and uh, again, all of the, all of the sort of symptoms. I mean, it's kind of a whack-a-mole exercise. I think that that um, the management team is having to deal with um, is um, is is instructive in terms of how we got there. Um, I think, you know, and allow me to just reflect a little bit, if I could sort of paint a picture of a, of a transit system. Um, you know, I would think about a comprehensive plan for what we want in our regional transit system that people take two or three years to sort of think about, uh, and then we go about implementing. Um, I would think about a consistent 95% on-time performance on all modes with a management team that accepts nothing less and investigates sort of why that didn't happen in that moment. Um, I, would, I would envision a system in which the commuters view the T as a viable alternative, not you know, when they wake up in the morning and they're in Franklin or the North Shore or someplace that they decide based on their day that the T might be a viable alternative. Uh, I envision a T that people think about data and what it's telling them and adjust service increase and decrease based on sort of what's going on. Um, where the labor force is actively engaged in making the T a better place to work, motivated to provide superior on-time customer service, 
and a labor force that not only just listens for what they're being told to do, but actually comes up with ways to, to do it. Uh, where bus garages and maintenance facilities take pride in supplying the vehicles necessary to run each of the lines or provide the bus service, uh, and um, that they're clean, they're reliable, they meet customer expectations, and that um, they have less than, and many times this is the case, less than 3% failures in service, because many times the train gets out, but it doesn't make it all the way to the other end, which is an experience I'm sure we've all had. Um, a T where customer service ratings are 90% or above, very good or excellent, where T workers feel a sense of pride in going to work, where they actually go to the Dunkin' Donuts or the bank and they don't hide the T emblem on their uniform, where they have a sense of pride and being at the nation's oldest transit system and being part of delivering the service we're talking about. Um, where non-primary functions, not just riding a bus or, or driving a bus or a train, um, is, a, is performed so well that they become business lines and products that are monetized, uh, which is more money and increased morale. Where innovative applications of technology are applied, where the construction departments viewed as the preeminent construction division, not just in the Commonwealth but across the country, where procurement is done competitively and smartly, where managers can come from across the country to see how we're doing it in, in Boston, and where the T is so good at attracting and developing managers that it produces general managers for other transit organizations and other public and private companies. And that the T recognizes that it has a big role. It's got a big role uh, in the conduct of business and commerce in the city and in the region and the quality of life and access and the reduction in congestion, cleanliness of our environment, and in our future economic development strategy, and what we want this region to be. Uh, to be. And, you know, I paint a picture, and for me, that's not a picture looking forward, that's a picture looking back. That's the T I remember of the late 80s and at the beginning of the 90s. Um, and I think it's the kind of place that um, that I'd like to see us begin to think about, uh, in a way, I, uh, Brian and I have talked about the fact that in the job he has, I describe it as the dish rag that sits on the side of the kitchen sink, and every morning it's neatly folded out of the drive, and by the end of the day it's the mustiest, dirty looking thing, and that's what this guy does every single day, and then he gets back up the next day and does it. He doesn't have the time or the focus or the ability to think about, step back and do a two to three year plan. We did that in 1969. You saw it on the video. I worked on the Red Line and the Orange Line project. I was implementing that plan, that vision for the future uh, of the city. Uh, the Money Room, uh, you know, it pains me because there was a time when the Money Room was the safest, secure, efficient money counting facility in the Commonwealth such that it actually bid for and won the contracts to count money for the city of Boston and for the city of Cambridge. It was better than banks. Banks stopped getting into the business. Today, what Brian found, and I would probably make the same decision that he has had to make, um, that, that he found something that forced him to think about you know, what he had to do. Um, but I think that we've got to get to a point, and, and, and Brian's doing this, where what I view is the crisis team, and I've used the analogy to describe what he's doing, um, is being the team sent down to, you know, a city or a, or a region that gets hit by a massive hurricane, and you've got to be the Red Cross. You've got to sort of go in and kind of stabilize and fix. And then you've got to get to a point where you're rebuilding. And you're rebuilding a management team, um, not that it is there for two or three years, but is there because uh, this is an organization they want to work in, they develop a level of expertise, and there's a consistent plan for capital reinvestment that gets us consistent with the objectives of the city and the region where we want to go. Um, so I think we're in a real critical point in which we have to support and applaud the work that, that Brian's doing, but we need to begin to also discuss 
what is it that we want in five and ten years for the region, like we saw was done in the 60s when they were in a moment like this. They did it. They decided that they were going to stop doing something and they, and they developed a plan and I happen to be the beneficiary of it, of it now because I got the buildings that people in the 60s actually worked on. So I would say from the business community perspective, which is my job now, we have to practice the fine art of being patiently impatient, um, which means patient with, with the team and what they're doing, but at the same time saying that we've got sections of the city like the Longwood Medical Area, like the South Boston Waterfront, like Kendall Square, that are starving today for better transit service. And we need to get to a place where, in addition to fixing all that the team is fixing, we have a sense that we know that those things are going to be fixed and we're going to get to a place where we leave a T behind that we're all proud of. So that's my thing.